Okay, um, I'm going to talk about the, the supernovae uh, connected to GRBs. So this is the, um, in the zoo of uh, GRBs in the hardness duration plot. Uh, and we have the short GRBs, the long GRBs, and then we have a new popula population as well, which are the ultra-long GRBs. I'm going to talk about all these. Um, let me see. Here's a different plot where you see the isotropic luminosity versus the duration. And we, talk, we, we heard about the low luminosity GRBs and the, I don't know, high luminosity GRBs here, the short GRBs and the ultra long GRBs. And they are all connected to stuff that's either supernovae or something that looks like supernovae or kilonovae. Um, I'm not going to be able to cover everything. Uh, so here are some of the recent reviews, especially there was a recent review by Mr. Kano, uh, which I recommend uh, you to read. So a brief history. Uh, so this is the first GRB supernova. We already heard about it. Uh, here it wasn't, and here, here it occurred. A couple of years later, it was pinpointed to this star-forming region, and here you see the supernova after a couple of years. Um, Here's the light curve. We already see this. We've already seen that uh, uh, before. It was fairly bright, uh, slightly brighter than a type 1A. Um, and shortly after, uh, Stan uh, um, made this uh, bold uh, prediction that all GBs produced by the collapser model will also make supernovae like this one. Um, and fortunately, a month before, in fact, there was a, a GRB which showed a you know, normal afterglow behavior and then uh, a data point that didn't fit uh, the uh, power law decay. Uh, and uh, so this is done by Alberto Castro Tirado and Javier Corozabal and Josh Bloom and his collaborators here. And so this was uh, suggested to be a redshift one GRB bump similar to 98BW. We still needed a spectroscopic confirmation, and so uh, you know, during these years, everybody was were looking for a normal GAB afterglow with a redshift, fairly nearby, so that we could observe the GAB uh, uh, supernovae. Uh, and so we were basically looking for a transition in the spectra from an afterglow power law behavior and transitioning into something that looks like a supernovae. And uh, this was the first uh, example of something that really looks like 98BW. Um, and here is uh, after you know subtracting of the host galaxy, uh, after subtracting the the afterglow. Basically, these two supernovae look very similar. I'm going to come back to the, the issue of whether they are similar or the diversity of GRB supernovae. So let me start out with the long GRB supernova connection, and uh, the supernova connection is all in in all cases it's one C with broad lines. Um, so first off, first off, here are the typical light curves that you see. I think uh, host galaxies have been subtracted here. But you see uh, quite a diversity and it's sort of a, it's somewhat, somewhat of a mess. Uh, these are probably the best cases. Uh, but you see in many cases this bump. In one case, you don't see a bump, and this is actually uh, 03 or 329, where there was no bump, which is basically uh, outshone by the afterglow, and also probably there was some uh, um, conspiracy with the, a break in the light curve. So th this is what we have to work on, on the, with the light curves. In fact, it's slightly worse because I said you know, th that there's also the host galaxy. And if we look at the, the range of properties of, of afterglows and host galaxies and uh, supernovae, this, this is the parameter space. And in some cases, the supernova will dominate if the afterglow is faint and the host galaxy is faint. But in many cases, the host galaxy might dominate or the afterglow might dominate. And that's why progress is a bit slow. There's tons of GRBs out there and also fairly low range of GRBs, but it's not always that we get uh, a decent opportunity to get spectra and de uh, detailed light curves. Uh, there has been quite a, a lot of claims of GRB supernovae, maybe of order 50 fairly reasonable uh, GRB supernovae. These are the good ones, uh, according to uh, uh, a classification I did with uh, Josh. Uh, and so if we, you can see that progress is sort of slow. It's about a one or one and a half a year. But now we can do some statistics. So let me look at some of the, uh, the properties of the population as a whole. And this is from Marian's uh, recent paper. 
this is the property, these are the, the typical spectra of 1Cs. And here you see spectra of 1CBLs, broad lined 1Cs. And by definition, the broad lined supernovae have broad lines, and therefore, you, what you see is that uh, they are broader here than here. Uh, you can also, so these contain both GAB supernovae and 1CBLs that are not connected to a GAB. You can split those in two, and here you have the, the B, 1CBLs with no GAB and the 1CBLs with the GAB. Uh, and they look fairly similar, but I think Mariam claims that the, these are slightly broader. Sorry? Okay, I'm sure you will. Good. <laughs> So why are they broad? Well, they're broad because of the uh, large velocities, and these are the silicon velocities uh, I'm sure here, uh, of all, of, say, after at around peak at 15 days, uh, about 20,000 kilometers per second. And so here's another plot from uh, Marian's recent paper that basically shows the, so now trying to couple the properties of the supernova to the properties of the GAB. And these are the absorption velocities as a function of the isotropic uh, luminosity in gamma rays. Um, and as we heard already, people like to separate GABs into low luminosity and high luminosity GABs. And so this is the separation about here. And what you can see is that the few cases where we have good measurements, there's no spectacular difference between the two kinds of supernovae. Um, we've also seen this before, and I'm sure we're going to see it again. So this is the separation of normal GABs and uh, low luminosity GABs, where you see them do separating out. Um, and this is the ejector velocity in the, in the radio and the kinetic energy, and you can see that, that the low luminosity GABs also separate out in the ejector velocity. Um, so these are believed to be jetted GABs. Um, these are believed to be something else that we heard, probably is a shock breakout uh, GABs, where the jet basically makes it to the, to the surface. Or you also have these guys, which are relativistic, uh, one BC, uh, one CBLs that were not, uh, had, had no G GAB counterpart. And so presumably they just basically, the jets, if there was a jet, which were, the jet didn't make it out. So these are called the engine uh, GABs, uh, engine supernovae, uh, characterized by a relativistic motion. So um, can we, comp so the question is, do the supernovae of these guys uh, look different from the supernovae of these guys? And here's the peak luminosity uh, in the V-band, which is basically where the spectrum of a, of a, of a GAB supernova peaks. Uh, plotted again as, uh, as a function of the isotropic luminosity. Uh, these are the low luminosity GBs and these are the high luminosity GBs. Um, there's no jet, there's no um, beaming angle correction here. Uh, so it's just basically the isotropic, in, isotropic e equivalent uh, luminosity. Um, you can see that there's no strong trends here, although that does pot potentially look like there's a sort of an envelope up here. I'm gonna come back to that. Um, so, we don't know what produces a GAB, but assuming that uh, 98BW is a good example, then it looks like uh, an, an, a nickel-powered, a radioactively powered GAB is uh, a supernova is a better description than a magnetar. Okay, so let's assume it's a collapsar. Um, the rates of the low luminosity GBs are similar to uh, the 1CBLs and much more common than these guys. And so that's just a little collimation as we already heard. Uh, if they are jet uh, breakout uh, 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 systems, then presumably the more nickel, the, the higher energy deposition, the more nickel you might produce. Whereas for a high luminosity GAB, if they're highly collimated, uh, the, the systems with a high 
uh, El ISO will basically be the most beamed ones. And so if you have a, lot, a small beaming, you'll produce less nickel. And so we do actually expect, in such a simple scenario, that uh, the more energy you inject, you will get produce more nickel. But out here, basically, you have a small opening angle, and therefore you produce less nickel. So that may be one explanation of this. Um, so these are the these were the um, the long GBs, uh, and then let me move on to the ultra long GBs. We have uh, very few of those that are known, maybe three or four. Um, and here's a spectacular uh, result by Jochen Greiner, I think. Uh, this is the uh, supernova compared to 98BW and some of the low luminosity uh, systems here and, and 1C here. And then a comparison to uh, superluminous supernovae. And so you can see that the brightness is intermediate between the superluminous supernovae and the 98BW. And uh, here's a model fit, and it looks like maybe a magnetized is preferred over a nickel-powered uh, GAB uh, supernova. Uh, this is more, more convincing. Uh, this, again, is 98BW, and a typical uh, GAB supernova, whereas this is the spectrum of this uh, ultra-long GAB supernova, and it's completely different. And in fact, it does look like, it, it, it more, more looks like a superluminous supernova spectrum. So, um, looks like potentially if superluminous supernovae are, 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 are millisecond magnetar powered, that this particular system may have had an ejection from a magnetar, potentially in addition to some nickel uh, production. On the other hand, uh, there's another ultra-luminous uh, GAB, ultra-long GAB that looks perfectly ordinary. So there's no simple uh, division here uh, between the two, but looks like there may be uh, an extra power source for the ultra-long GABs. I am going to mostly skip uh, this because we heard of it uh, before. So just to show the data that excludes that, um, that, there are super, that, uh, that there are supernovae associated with short GRBs. We have never seen a supernova in a short GRB spectrum. And so this is one example comparing to 98BW and then much fainter uh, supernovae. And here's another one where basically comparing to one of the faint one Cs and you can see the upper limits. So there are no supernovae associated with uh, short GRBs. And we've seen the kilonova stuff, so I'm gonna skip that. Well, let me just say that this is the, 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 the result of uh, Tanvir and Berger, and, 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 and this is this one data point that makes us believe that there's a kilonova. Uh, and then sub su subsequently, there's been a couple of papers suggesting that in other GRB, other short GRBs, uh, that there may be a little uh, excess emission in the red bands. Uh, it, it, um, it, it, it's not very conspicuous. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not gonna uh, go into detail about explaining where you see it. And here's another one which basically suggests that uh, in 050709 that the slopes in the, in the B band and the I band is different and that there may be some extra emission here. So that's hard to rule out. Uh, but I guess it shows that it's very hard to detect kilonovi in, uh, in short GBs. So what I wanted to com come back to is uh, some, <clears throat> some recent work as to whether <clears throat> there's a luminosity width relation for GAB supernova. And so, so there were some very early claims that there, that there would be such a relation and there were some claims that were none and so on. So I decided with a student to take a look at at, at that question, right? So as we know, there's a Phillips relation for one uh, A supernovae, which basically relates to delta M15, which means that the decay rate, the, the decay in magnitudes in 15 days past peak, uh, and uh, that that's related then to the, to the peak magnitude in the B band of one A's. And so this is what uh, make Mark Phillips uh, famous and also people allow people to study the accelerating universe. Um, 
So here are some of the, the best sampled uh, GB uh, supernova light curves. Um, and as you can see, just in, in this plot, which basically shows the, the peak brightness as a function of time in the rest frame, that there does seem to be a relation in that the fainter ones have peak early uh, and uh, the brighter ones peak late. And so to quantify that, we basically measure delta M15 and the peak magnitude uh, in the best way possible. Especially we try to match the V-band, I mean, without you know, going into details, but basically you, you, you are concerned especially about K-corrections and also extinction uh, corrections. Um, so K-corrections you can try and minimize by observing in the band that matches the, the, the an observed band that matches the rest frame V. And the extinction, fortunately for GFEs, we have a better handle than on supernovae, basically, because we can f try and model the, the afterglow emission. So if you try and rescale, uh, basically, in delta M15 and the peak magnitude, you see that actually, and these are data points, uh, the, the, the light curves look like you, they can be rescaled into each other. Um, and so another way of showing that then is to plot the luminosity with relation. And uh, the background data is actually how the 1A data look like for nearby 1As. And the blue points are the scarce data we have on, uh, on uh, GAB supernovae. Uh, and there are uh, large error bars in some of them. And this is the, the you know, th these come from many, many, uh, um, sources. In some cases, it's very hard to get a, um, an, a, uh, a robust measurement of the time of the peak. You really need a data before the peak, for example. And in many cases, if you just fit some uh, parametric light curve, well, you can get, you know, you, 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 your result will be uh, reflective of what, whatever you, try to, you decide to fit. We try to do this non-parametrically to basically see, figure out where, where is the peak in, in an on non-parametric way, and sometimes that gives large errors. Uh, and also in the peak magnitude, the main uh, contribution to the error in the, in the peak magnitude is basically the extinction correction. And for some of these, especially the, the ones that are not, uh, which are open circles, one here and one here, there are large uh, errors in the extinction correction. But basically what you can uh, still uh, see from this plot is that the slope of the luminosity width relation is about similar to the one, that of 1As, and the GAB supernovae are slightly brighter, but not by a lot. Um, what happens if you do a classic size for all, all supernovae? Uh, I think uh, Maria Drought has a paper on that, and basically there's none, there's no relation. Um, so this, you know, I'm not going to go into much detail. I don't know how to set this up, but some ideas, but I think this is an important constraint on models. If you want to simulate, if you want to try and produce a GAB supernova, uh, you need to be able to set up a luminosity width relation, and also you need to make them sufficiently bright, and you need to produce enough nickel to do that. Um, of course, you can then uh, play the game of... Um, of uh, doing the same uh, game as the 1A people did uh, some time ago. Uh, and so this is uh, the resulting GAB supernova Hubble diagram uh, from these data. Um, and the, the only really tricky part is that data point, which is 98BW. Because uh, you need to anchor the Hubble diagram. And the way to do that is basically, you know, the advantage of 98BW is that it's low redshift. Of course, then it's completely dominated by, I mean, you know, you'll be, uh, the, the major, major source of uncertainty is the peculiar velocity. And so what we d tried to do was to use a constrained uh, uh, cosmological simulations of the local volume to try and, and infer the peculiar velocity instead of just assigning a huge velocity. And so this is how we bring this error down. If we can't do that, then you can't do that. Um, the other way of doing this potentially would be if you, if, if one CBLs or perhaps relativistic one CBLs turn out to be similar to these guys, 
because then we can build up a sample at low redshift of one CBLs and put them on the plot. Uh, I was inspired by a previous speaker, so now we have a, a evidence for a dark energy, in fact, if we try and play this game. Um, so we, we actually got, like if you, if you try and fit for cosmological parameters in a flat universe, omega lambda, omega matter, uh, you, you will actually get two sigma evidence for dark energy from eight GFE supernovae. I think that's better than the 1A, 1A people did <coughs> in those days. Okay, so uh, yeah. Um, there are some advantages of, of, of doing this kind of stuff. Uh, of course, for GRB, typically the redshift will be known right away. Um, host galaxies are faint at high redshift. We want to do this at high redshift. We're not going to compete with the 1A uh, stuff at low redshift. Um, we can ex determine the extinction directly from the afterglow. The time of explosion is known. These guys are bright, and uh, also we, we don't need to type them because we know that what they are, and so you know they're fairly cheap in terms of HST or James Webb uh, Space Telescope time. Um, and we could go to redshift date. So this would be one way of probing funny dark energy at high redshift. Uh, and this just to show that you know when we add the points now to the, what has already been published, uh, it looks like there's still a very nice relation. Um, these two are the relativistic one BCs, so that's uh, 09 BB and 12 AP. Uh, and you know, continuing with more data, it still looks like the, there's a relation here. This is the superluminous supernovae, and these are some 1CBLs that are not relativistic. Okay, I think uh, I'm more or less uh, done with the review I wanted to make. Um, this is a, I'm fine now. So uh, we have two kinds of GRBs. It looks like both are engine driven. These may be uh, shock breakout, uh, these are jetted uh, systems, both uh, nickel powered and both uh, potentially useful as standard candles. Whether you want to use them for um, high redshift cosmography or whether you just want to use the existence of a luminosity width relation to constraining models of GRBs. Ultra luminous GRBs looks like they might be partially uh, powered by something else, um, similar to uh, superluminous supernovae. Short GRBs we already heard about, very likely related to near infrared kilonovae. Uh, and something I didn't cover, I could cover, but uh, I, I don't have to. There are a couple of GRBs. Okay, so the question is, do all GRBs uh, come in relation to a supernova, or are there GRBs with no associated supernova? And there are two claimed, or maybe three claimed uh, systems where a long GRB uh, was not associated with a supernova. Um, one of them has also been claimed to be a short GRB, and actually there was, a, I just flipped uh, through one of the slides which showed that there was potentially a kilonova in that one. So that would be a good indication that that is not a long GRB. And the other one is very contentious. It's also been claimed by half the community to be a short GRB, and half the community keeps claiming it's a long GRB. But certainly, uh, you know, I think there's a, a certain chance that, in fact, that one also is a, is a, um, a merger uh, system. Uh, and the third one uh, is uh, 04, 07, 01. And that uh, we have followed up with SWIFT. And uh, the afterglow that was thought to be the afterglow of a GAB uh, is still there. It's variable. It's probably an AGM. So uh, I don't think we have a lot of cases of uh, with strong, strong cases where there are GABs with no supernova. And so it looks like uh, there's a simple uh, picture where basically all GABs are associated with supernova. Thanks. Yeah, so for your ultra-long duration GRBs, uh, okay, I, it's a theoretical point and I shouldn't be making it, but let me go ahead anyway. The idea of it's a magnetar and a GRB, uh, I think at least theoretically that I would say is challenging. You can't, in a simple way, choose both of them. I agree.
you know, if you want to invoke a magnetar to make a normal GRB, you need a very rapid spin down time, and, and so rapid that, you know, the magnetar is spun down by the time it would be contributing to the supernova. But if you have an ultra long GRB like the one that yeah, Yokin was studying, um, you know, you, you, you have a situation where you, you can get, you know, a, a large, you know, a large amount of energy injection for a significant period of time, but also have enough energy left to contribute some to the supernova. So I, I think there is some middle ground where you can get both. Um, Sorry, uh, no, Brian, that, that doesn't work because the peculiar thing about GRBs is their collimation, okay? That distinguishes them very clearly uh, observationally. So it's not a question of energy. You have to actually produce power, collimated power. So unless you have a realistic physical model, this would be uh, just another theoretical suggestion. By now, we, we know cosmological parameters to the percent level. So I, I, I don't think it would be uh, useful to motivate uh, the GRB supernova connection for that. But on the other hand, at, at very high redshifts, there is a new piece of information that we can get, which is the optical depth uh, to electron scattering. So if you can bring it down to 5% level at redshift 8 uh, by having a lot of them, then that would be a, an independent measure of the optical depth uh, that is not related to the microwave background. Yeah, getting a, a large GRB at redshift 8 is probably going to be difficult. So you mentioned those two GRBs uh, with no supernova. So those were two that were claimed to be long-duration gamma bursts, but they had a short spike and a long tail. Yep. And of course, um, there were two nature papers claiming they were long-duration gamma bursts. But have you gone back or any of your collaborators to see, to look at other such short spike but long-duration or long-tail GRBs to see, um, to, to see if there are any kind of other optical emission at later times? I don't, I don't think so. I, I, I actually, I mean, it's, just, it's not something you go back because mm -hmm. you have to do the observations. Yeah, of course, of course. So uh, um, what I, what I, what I did try to do was to go over all low redshift systems and figure out and, and tr look mm -hmm. for systems which, where you could safely rule out the existence of a supernova, and there are no data except the ones that I talked about. Right. So, so, so it's not like that. that there's a lot of systems which could, which, which. I, I, where there's any evidence that, uh, w whether it's a long or short, that there would be, uh, no, sorry, whether there's a spike or not. I mean, I think typically, if you have a spike and it's very short and it has extended emission, people are happy to, claim, to, to suggest that they are, you know, sh mergers, right? If, so it's T90 is not a very good indicator of, uh, of whether it's one or the other, right? So many cases, I'm sure, of, uh, of what we heard this morning, there may be systems that have durations, T90 durations, longer than two seconds. Uh, like 06, 06, uh, 14 has a duration, I think, of 100 seconds. So I, I had a, a, a brief comment and then a question. I think this issue of the nickel production in GRB supernova is extremely important. I mean, we originally think of these as, as, as failed supernova, and in fact, these are very successful supernova. Mm -hmm. Uh, and if you just confine the nickel producing region to a narrow jet, I think as you discussed, it's really hard to get these, these nickels. So if you, if you want a black hole model, which I think is you know, still viable, you need a way to blow up the star in a very nearly spherical way with a lot of energy producing a lot of shock powered nickel, yet still have some matter coming back, falling in, creating the black hole, powering the engine. So I think this is challenging. Uh, and uh, I guess so the question is, uh, I mean, there are maybe other ways to do it through the accretion disk outflows, but I guess the question I had is, is what is the update on sort of the nickel masses required for the GRB supernova versus sort of normal 1BCs? These, if I recall, there's even higher, right? Uh, I'm not an expert. I think it's probably 0.2 to 0.4. That's higher than the typical 1Cs, right? Yeah. I mean, they're similar to the 